All right, so St. Anthony's School in New Alm, welcome to you. Plainview, Plainview Elgin, Milgen, Mil, oh my goodness, having a hard time. Plainview, Elgin, Millville, welcome to you. Um, Sleepy Eye Public fourth grade, welcome. We are glad to have Mrs. Ekstrom's second grade class with us. Mr. Schmoltz from Lewiston Altura Elementary third graders, we welcome you. Holy Trinity in Piers, Minnesota, Mrs. Gangles third graders, hello. Um, let's see, Cross Lake Community School, um, Mrs. O'Brien and Ms. Siebert, welcome to you. Mrs. Delos, Delos Strudos, fourth grade in New York. Awesome, glad to have you all the way from New York. Mrs. Waters, Homecroft Elementary, Duluth, Minnesota. Wow, lots of great attendees today. So we are very, very excited to have all of you join us. It looks like there's a few more um, coming in. We have a homeschool family, excellent. We're happy to have you here as well. But we are so excited to offer a virtual field trip here in February. So welcome. Uh, my name is Sue Knott, and I'm an education specialist with the Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom program. And these virtual field trips are a fun way to bring agriculture to you in your classrooms. So if you are joining us on Zoom, the Q&A feature is going to be your friend. You can put questions in there, and we will ask them to our hosts today. If you are joining us on YouTube, you can use the comment section, and we'll try to get your questions posed as well. Most of the time, we're not able to ask all of the questions, but we will do our best. So today we are going to travel virtually to Perm, Minnesota. Before we go there though, I do wanna tell you that we have Evan Carlson, who is the Director of Marketing for Bongard's Creamery. He is in their headquarters, their office headquarters in Chanhassen, Minnesota. So Evan's here to help answer some questions. Um, he, like I said, is in his office in Chanhassen, but the star of the show is gonna be Justin Larson, who is the plant manager at the Bongard's Creamery in Perm, Minnesota. So I'm going to, Toss it over to, to Justin, who, like I said, is at the cheese plant in Perm, where he's the manager. He's going to give us a little background of, of Vanguards and um, a brief tour of how milk is being made into cheese. So welcome, Justin. Hi. Thanks for having me today. So uh, my name is Justin Larson. I'm the plant manager here at our, uh, in our Perm plant in Perm, Minnesota. Um, Vanguards was originally founded in 1908 as a co-op. Um, we currently have three processing facilities, one in Humboldt, Tennessee, one in Norwood, Minnesota, and then, uh, of course, the best one here in Perm, Minnesota. Um, today, we're standing in our make room, and uh, we call it our make room because this is where all the magic happens. So this is where we take the milk and we, uh, we convert it into cheese. So the first vat we're going to be looking in here, um, and the reason we call it a vat, it's the vessel that we actually, the milk goes into, and we actually, this is where we make our product. So it holds about 60,000 pounds of milk. Um, the milk gets pasteurized first, goes in there. We add the appropriate ingredients. Um, our ingredients that were used would be starter bacteria. Starter is just like adding flavor. So if you wanna think about uh, the different kinds of cheese that are out there. So mozzarella uses a different kind of starter than a cheddar. And the milk comes into the vat as you see. And once the vat is actually full, then it kind of moves on to another step. So we have eight vats in here. So at any given time, seven vats have product in them. Each one of these vessels holds about uh, 11,000 pounds of cheese. That's a lot of cheese. So Justin, we have our first question. We see those metal pieces moving. What do you call those and what are they doing? Well, that is a great question. Those are agitators. So uh, in this particular style of vat, the agitator actually keeps the milk and uh, keeps stirring the milk. And then on the other side of that agitator is, uh, is some knives. And so when it goes to, once we add a coagulant, which is called rennet, um, it's kind of like the glue that binds all the solids together. Um, then the agitators will actually spin in the other direction and then they'll be cutting into the cheese curds that you'd see. So our next so question, Justin, is, oh, sorry to interrupt, but one, another oh, question, ahead. how, how big are the vats? Like how much could they hold? So they can hold 60,000 pounds of milk. Awesome. So another, last question for now, Mrs. Sawyer's first grade class from Ortonville, Michigan would like to know what kind of cheese is being made right now? So currently today we're making cheddar cheese. Awesome, thanks. We'll actually go down and kind of look later on in the process. 
So the vat that we're heading to now is actually after all the ingredients were added, um, it was coagulated and turned into a, into a curd. So you can see the big difference between looking at the milk going in, and then now you see curds and whey. Be quite, quite a bit of curds and whey in there right now. So Justin, there's a question. You said you added the coagulant, which is rennet. And now we can see that milk is, is in the curds and whey. How long does that take? So the, the coagulant takes uh, roughly about 20 minutes for it to turn it from uh, a liquid milk into almost like a jello or pudding substance. We actually have a vat that's going to be that's in that process right now. So we can go take a look at that. Yeah, that'd be great. As we're as we're going over there, Brooke from Mrs. Dello Strido's class wants to know how much cheese do you make in a year? Um, last year we made 168 million pounds of cheese. Okay, say that number one more time. 168 million. All right, 168 million. That's a lot of cheese. So then the next question from the same class is how much milk does it take to make that much cheese? Well, so the easy way to look at milk is it would be roughly uh, 100 pounds of milk turns into uh, 10 pounds of cheese. So be, yeah, I'm not, I don't have a calculator with me right now, so I don't even want to guess on the number. Well, that's a great math question. We were, we were over 5 billion pounds of milk last year. Awesome. If anyone is in, in math class right now and wants to figure that out, it was, Justin, tell us the number one, my time, one more time. How many million pounds of cheese? So it'll be 168 million pounds of cheese. 168 million pounds, and it takes 100 pounds of milk for 10 pounds of cheese. So yeah, any so mathematicians? On a, on a typical year, we'll process somewhere around 1.5 billion pounds of milk. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. All right. So, so Justin, tell us what you're showing us now, please. So right now, the vat we're looking in is uh, the ingredients were added. So we added the starter bacteria, and then we added the rennet. And now we're just letting, waiting for it to set up. This process, like I said, took about 20 minutes. Um, so as you can see right now, it's still in like a liquid form. And then shortly, it'll start converting over to a curd form. So I don't know. We have a little bit of time. So I don't know if there's any other questions while we're in this room. Sure, there's a couple waiting. questions. The first one is, Justin, how did you learn how to make cheese? So I'm actually third generation into the cheese industry. So my, my dad is a cheese man or cheese head. We, we also like the Packers, so I guess we could be cheese heads. But, and then uh, my grandma and grandpa were also in the cheese industry. So did you need any special education or did your grandparents and parents teach you what you need um, to know? There is a uh, universities that do specialize in, uh, in if you if you want to get into the cheese industry, but uh, no, you don't need a special education to get in the cheese industry. Okay, so here's a question from Shelly. She wants to know how from how far away does the milk come from? So is it from farms relatively close by, or does the the milk travel a, a distance before it, it comes to your cheese making plant? Yeah, most of our milk uh, comes from about 150 mile radius. Um, and then it would come from our member owners. So we have over 400 member owners. All right, fantastic. We have a few more questions. Um, why are you wearing a shower cap and are there other special clothes <laughs> that you have to wear? It's not quite a shower cap, it's a hairnet, but uh, that's a great question. And, and yes, we have to wear eye protection and then hearing protection. So. so normally I'd have a bump hat on, but it doesn't work very well with the headset. So today I can wear the bump hat. Okay, so Josie from Mr. Polson's class wants to know, what do you call the, the big like room or place that you are right now in the cheese plant? Does it have a special name? Uh, we call it our make room. And that's like I uh, kind of said in the beginning, it's because that's, this is where we make our cheese. Great, so, okay, one more question so from can, Zach. Sure. Can I ask you one more question? He, Zach wants to know, how do you get the different flavors of cheese? So I know you said you're making cheddar right now. What yeah. would be different if you were making mozzarella or squish? Swiss or a different flavor? So the biggest difference is just the uh, starter culture that's used. So it's, uh, we use concentrated bacteria and uh, that bacteria gives a different kind of flavor. So a mozzarella would use a different strand of uh, starter culture versus a cheddar. 
So if we look in the vat now, we're actually, uh, you can see that it's starting to coagulate. So it went from the liquid form and then now it's kind of in like a pudding type substance. And then now we'll go ahead and I'll close it up because it's ready to cut. And then we'll be able to watch the, uh, the cut step. You wanna go ahead and start the cut? So as this is working or starting to, to do the cut, Justin, um, Kylie wants to know how many people work in this, um, in this plant in, in um, Purim? Okay. So the Purim facility, we have uh, uh, roughly 138 employees. Great. Oh, and here Emma would like to know, or Emmett, I'm sorry, would like to know how, how long have you personally been making cheese? So I've been making cheese since uh, 2009. Um, I've been with Bongard since uh, 2015. All right, so here's another question from, from Bailey. Um, Bailey wants to know what temperature does the cheese, what temperature is the cheese at? Is it hot or is it cold? Well, that's a great question. So currently right now when the milk goes into the vat, it's at roughly about 90 degrees. Um, and then depending on what type of cheese we make, we also, these, these vats or vessels that you're seeing the, the cuts happen in right now, they actually have steam jackets on it that can actually heat up the curd. So once the cut is done, we'll actually cook the curd. So we'll, uh, we'll cook it up to this particular product today. We'll cook it up to about 102 degrees Fahrenheit. 102. All right. So here's another question from Paisley. She wants to know in one day, how many pounds of cheese are you able to make? So on a typical day, we'll be somewhere between 420,000 pounds and uh, 460,000 pounds of cheese, just depending on what type of cheese we're making. Okay, another question. This is from Sherry. How many years has this, has this cheese plant been in existence or been functioning? So Bongard's purchased this plant in 2004. Um, originally, the plant was owned by Land O'Lakes. Um, so this plant has been here since the 1950s. Um, but Bongard's purchased it in 2004. All right, Land O'Lakes, that's maybe a, a name that, that people recognize as well. So here's a question from one of our YouTube viewers. In the make room, which you said you're in right now, how many people work in this specific area? Uh, there would be one person in this room. Fantastic. Okay, so Justin, I know we have the video that we wanted to show everybody. Is there, there anything that you would like to show us in this make room before we transition to that? No, I think we pretty much covered everything in this area. Okay, awesome. Well, we have a recorded video because Justin and Evan wanted you guys, um, you viewers, to be able to see some of the processing that isn't necessarily done at the Purim um, plant. It's done at some of the other locations that Justin mentioned. So we have a, a short video. It's about eight minutes that we're going to um, show to you that shows how cheese slices and shredded cheese and other cheese products are made. So I do have a challenge, though, for you guys as, as you watch. You're going to see two forms of of cheese and it's a, in a large form. There's gonna be blocks and there's gonna be barrels. So I want you to um, listen and tell me, be ready to tell, or you can put it in the, the Q and A, how big are those blocks and what cheese products are the blocks made into? And then also how big are the barrels and what, what cheese products are the barrels made into? So my, my colleague Carrie is our tech person. I think we are ready to start the video, Carrie. So whenever you wanna press, press play. Each of our farmer owners milk their cows two to three times daily, and this milk is sent to our plant in Purim, Minnesota, which is currently capable of processing 3.5 million pounds of milk each day. Once the milk arrives at the plant, the sample is taken for quality testing. This sample is tested for antibiotics, temperature, odor, and acidity to ensure it meets Bongard's quality standards. Once the milk passes testing, it is pumped out of the trucks and pasteurized. Pasteurization requires the milk to be heated to a temperature of 161.5 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds to kill any microorganisms that might be present. Next, the milk is pumped into cheese making vats. Each vat holds 55,000 pounds of milk and a starter culture is added to begin to turn the milk into cheese. Different starter cultures are used to create different types of cheese and this will help generate lactic acid for flavor development. Each vat can be monitored from a control panel manned by one of our experienced operators. Next, rennet is added to the vat, 
which causes the fat and protein molecules to bind together, turning liquid milk into a yogurt-like consistency. For this coagulation to take place, the agitator is shut off. After 30 minutes, the fat and protein molecules have bonded, and the agitator is turned back on to cut the curds into quarter-inch cubes. The curds are cooked for 30 minutes until they reach 101 degrees. The curds and whey are sent to the draining matting machine, where the whey begins to drain from the curd. After crossing the drain screen, the cheese curds fall into a belt where the whey continues to drain and the starter culture continues to consume lactose, creating lactic acid and lowering the pH of the cheese. It will take about an hour to reach the right moisture and pH levels. If the cheese will become a 40 pound block, it is milled into four inch strips, which helps maintain desired moisture levels. If it will be packaged into a 500 pound barrel, it is constantly stirred to prevent knitting and to keep the moisture levels low. Next, the cheese curds fall onto the salting mellowing conveyor, where a precise amount of salt is added to achieve the optimum level of quality, texture, moisture, and flavor. After about 30 minutes, the cheese has absorbed the right amount of salt and is ready for packaging. If the cheese is going into barrels, it is fed into a crumbler and blown into the barrels. If the cheese will become a 40 pound block, it is sent to the block towers, which helps it knit together by using gravity. As it travels down the block tower, the remaining undesired moisture is removed and the cheese becomes a block. These blocks are packaged in bags with an oxygen barrier to preserve the quality of the cheese. The beta vac machine vacuums all of the air out of the package and seals it with heat. This will prohibit mold growth as the cheese ages. Next, the cheese goes through our metal detector, which can detect even very small pieces of metal if present. The boxer puts a cardboard liner around the block of cheese, and each block is weighed and inkjetted. Finally, the cheese is sent into storage to age to the desired flavor and texture. First, the blocks are unpackaged and cubed into smaller pieces before heading up the conveyor belt into the shredder. The cheese is shredded or diced to the desired width and length. Anti-caking powder is applied to prevent the shreds from sticking to one another. The shreds are weighed, then released into bags, which are gas flushed to displace oxygen and inhibit mold growth. Bags are pulled off the line and checked regularly to ensure they do not leak and to ensure there isn't residual oxygen. They are submerged in a pressurized water tank, and if air bubbles show up, that means the bag does not have an airtight seal. Next, a label is applied to the bag, and they are packaged into cases, palletized, and are now ready to be enjoyed by our customers. Once the natural cheese is aged to the desired flavor and texture, it is sent to one of our cheese processing plants. The barrels are unpackaged and sent to the grinder. It takes about two minutes to grind a 500 pound barrel, and once complete, the cheese is ready to be sent to the blender. Meanwhile, the slurry is being crafted. Each cheese formula has a precise recipe, so each ingredient is measured before being added to the slurry mixer, where the ingredients are mixed together for about 15 minutes. In the blender, the slurry and cheese are mixed together for about 30 minutes and then sent to the cooker. In the cooker, the cheese is cooked until it reaches 165 degrees for 30 seconds via steam injection which pasteurizes the cheese. The cheese is now ready to become a processed loaf or slice. On the loaf line, film is unrolled, sealed, and formed into pouches that are loaded into trays.
Now the trays are filled with cheese and the top is sealed. Each loaf passes through a metal detector and a lid is applied. The loaves are now ready to be loaded into a shipper, palletized, and sent to the blast cooler, where they are quickly cooled to below 40 degrees. To make processed slices, the cheese is spread onto the casting belts and cooled from 165 degrees to 40 degrees in about two minutes. While on the casting belt, lecithin is applied to the surface to help prevent the slices from sticking to one another. Once cool, the slices are cut into ribbons, which are layered on top of one another and cut to the desired size. The slices travel down the line to the packaging area, where they are wrapped in film and sealed. Each package is ink jetted with a date and time and sent through the metal detector. Finally, the cheese is ready to be loaded into shippers, palletized and sent to the cooler. Buying guards regularly tests our cheese for performance and safety to ensure we are maintaining the highest quality standards. Okay, well, we hope you enjoyed seeing some of those those cheese products that are a result of the different processing that Bond Guards does. I don't know if anyone um, heard the answer to my challenge, but the, the cheese blocks are 40 pounds. And those blocks are what were shown that um, is used to make the shredded cheese. And then the barrels, 500 pounds, that's how big those are. And they were used to make the um, processed American slices and then the loaves that was at the end of that video. But we're gonna return to Justin at the Bond Guards um, cheese plant in Purim. And he is in the area, well, I'll, I'll let you tell, he's no longer in the make room, he's in a new location. So Justin, we're back to you. There we go. You're good to go, Justin, go ahead. Okay, so hold on, we've lost your audio, Justin. Can you hear me now? Um, All right. How about now? Yes. All right, awesome, sorry about that. So we're currently in our tower room and uh, we, we, what we have in here is we actually have six block form towers. And the purpose of a tower is it takes that cheese curd and it actually forms it into a 40 pound block. So inside of each one of these columns, if you look up above, each one of these columns holds about 40 blocks of cheese. There's about 1,600 pounds of cheese in each one of these towers at any given time. So depending on what kind of product we're making, today we're actually making the barrel product. So the blocks come out and then they go down a conveyor. And at the end of the conveyor, we actually have a crumbler that crumbles it back into a curd form. And then, uh, and then we roll it over to our fill station where we fill the 500 pound barrels. Each one of these towers will kick out a block about every 33 seconds. And, uh, and the easiest thing to think about when you think about a cheese tower is it's really, it's, it's just to get it into the packageable size form. Um, there is a little bit of stuff that happens in the tower. There's actually a screen on the inside. So we pull vacuum on the column. So that's what kind of gets rid of some of the air voids. And then it also gets rid of some of the way. So Justin, um, Mrs. Dello Strido's class wants to know what happens if one of the machines goes down or isn't working properly? Um, if one of them would go down, it would, uh, it would just impact, you start to get some downtime. Um, we need all of the machines to be operating correctly in order to keep up with our production. So if one of them went down right now, I said I'd get on the phone and I would get a hold of our maintenance group and then a maintenance technician would come out and help fix it. Okay, so here's another question. This is from Cassidy from Mr. Brown's class. He wants to know 
um, why some cheese is hard and some cheeses are soft. Um, the biggest difference in cheese between hard and soft would be the moisture. So like if you get a soft cheese, it's typically a higher moisture cheese. Um, the harder the cheese would be then, of course, the lower moisture cheese. It's a very good question though. So Justin, you mentioned that these blocks are going to get crumbled and put into barrels. Are we able to see that or is that not accessible? Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll walk over there right now. Fantastic. As you're walking, we have a couple more questions. So Josie wants to know, do you make butter at this, at this plant or only cheese? Um, we only make cheese. So then Ben from Mr. Brown's class wants to know, how do you get, do you guys make any powdered cheese in Bond Guards and how does that happen? Uh, no, we do not make any powdered cheese. Um, powdered cheese would be made at a different facility. Bongard doesn't make any powdered cheese. Um, but the way that powdered cheese is made is it's actually kind of, it's turned into that slurry, like what you saw on the screen at the processing plants. And then it's actually then put into a cheese dryer. So it's sprayed into a spray dryer where it's dried into a powder. So this is our barrel fill station. So there's a pre-fill auger and then a final fill auger. So the barrel that's right here is in the final fill auger. The barrel will go down, it'll have natamycin, which is just an anti-mold sprayed on top of it. And then there's a series of press heads and then it's vacuum sealed down at the end. So how long does it take for one of those barrels to get, to get filled to 500 pounds? So it fills and run a little over a minute. Wow, that's pretty fast. So here's a question yeah. from Scott. He says, Justin, being a cheesemaker, what is your favorite type of cheese to make and your favorite type to eat? So my favorite type of cheese is cheddar Parmesan. So it's a mixture of cheddar cheese and Parmesan. Um, and I would say that, that that's probably my favorite to make too. We do, uh, we do make it here periodically and we sell it at our cheese store. So we actually have a cheese store here in Perm, and then we actually, and then we have another one in Norwood. So that's a great segue to this next question from Kelly. She wants to know what is Bongard's best selling cheese? I would have to pass that one over to Evan. So Evan can maybe take that one. He's a little closer to that. I'm more tied to the production side. Yeah, so we sell a lot of American cheese slices. That's definitely one of our, our highest movers in the state of Minnesota. Actually, our three pound loaf of American slices is one of the, the biggest selling cheeses in the entire state in grocery stores. So you can certainly find that uh, in a lot of local grocery stores or at any of those local Bongard stores that Justin was referencing. So that, Evan, relates to a question that Mrs. Jensen's class is asking. They want to know how far do you ship your dairy products? We've, they've seen them in their high V stores. So if you want to talk about where you ship them and, and where people might find them to purchase them, that would be awesome. Yeah, so our, our products are actually sold around the globe for that matter. So we sell a lot in retail stores in the state of Minnesota. So the local high V's, the Coburn's, um, some Walmart stores, just different grocery stores across Minnesota, you can buy a lot of our products uh, in that form. We sell a lot, the majority of the products we sell actually go to food service accounts. So when you go out to eat at a fast food restaurant and you get a cheeseburger, there's a pretty good chance that some of the cheese that you've eaten in the past is actually Bongard's cheese. So we sell a lot of cheese to restaurants. We sell a lot of cheese to K through 12 schools. So uh, many of the, the students watching this today may actually be served Bongard's cheese sticks uh, at their local school. So we have a lot of product going to schools, a lot of product going to grocery stores, um, a lot of product that goes to other manufacturers that use it as an ingredient in products that they make. And then, like I said, we actually sell cheese to Korea and South America and a lot of different uh, places around the globe as well. Wow, thanks, Evan. That's awesome. All over the world. So, Justin, I'm going to go back to you with a couple more questions. So, Nora okay. and Jace are curious about the people who work at that plant. Do you have different shifts? And what sort of hours do, do the um, people who help make cheese, what, what hours do they work? Yeah, so typically uh, we have, we run 24 seven. So we have two shifts every day. Um, so there'd be a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift, and then there'd be a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift. And then, and then there's two rotations, sorry. I guess I could finish that one a little bit. Is it's, uh, so we actually have two rotations. So one week the operators will work four days, 
And then the next week they work three days. So this is a question from Harvey. He wants to know if, it, if there are cheeses that are easy to make and other varieties that are more difficult to make. I would say that all cheese is hard to make just because it's a living thing. Um, but there definitely is certain cheese types that are harder to make. Um, when you get into some of the hard Italian type style cheeses, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, it's cooked up to a lot warmer temperature and has a tendency to string together. So, but all cheese is hard because it's kind of a, it's a process that has to be watched, monitored. Um, so all cheese is pretty difficult. Okay, good to know. It's a, it's a challenge to make cheese. That's, that's great. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. I just want to tell you that Mr. Schmoltz's class just put in this, the Q&A that they just found out that their cheese sticks are bond guards and they think they're delicious and very yummy. So that is exciting to hear. So you guys, it's 1.30. Our 30 minutes, our 30 minute virtual tour is, is pretty much over. But I do have one question that I want both Evan and Justin to answer and, and tell our viewers, what is your favorite part about working for bond guards and Justin for you actually making cheese and Evan for you um, helping with the, the marketing and, and getting cheese to, to us to eat. So Justin, I'll have you go first. What is your favorite part about making cheese? I'd have to say I have two favorite things. Uh, one would be the people that I work with. It's, uh, it's pretty fun to work with the group of people that I work with every day. And then the second one is just working for our, our farmer owners. It's pretty cool to know that we're giving back to our local farmers. So that's, I'd say those are the two things that, uh, that I enjoy the most. Thanks, Justin. How about you, Evan? What do you enjoy most about getting the cheese to people like us to eat? Yeah, um, you know, working in marketing with food, especially cheese, is just a, a fun place to work. Um, you know, everybody eats, everybody loves cheese, so it's it's just a fun environment to work in and a, a great product to sell. And I'd echo what, what Justin said about working for a farmer-owned co-op. That, to me, is one of the, the great uh, elements and reasons why I came to work at Bongards is the, no, the nature of it being owned by farmers and just knowing that you're helping those farmers uh, add some value to their their milk and just helping them uh, and helping them grow their farms and, and supporting them in that way. So being a, a you know, supporting a farmer owned co-op is a, is a great organization to work for. Well, thanks, Evan. That's awesome to hear as well. And I thank both of you, Justin and Evan, for your time, for letting giving us a behind the scenes tour of Bond Guards and your, your time with us this morning. We certainly had fun. I learned a lot of new things. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Your questions were awesome. I know I didn't get to ask all of them, but but a majority of them. So thanks for, for joining us. If you love these virtual field trips, we do have another one in February, February 28th. We're going to go to the Pollinator Center at the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So you can, can register and join us for that one. We also, teachers, have our spring ag mags. So we have ag mags for kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. These are free, and we have our spring issues that are going to be coming out in just a couple weeks. So you can sign up for those and we'll, we'll have more agriculture learning for you. And what I'm most excited about next week, so February 14th through the 18th is national, well, February is National I Love to Read Month. And we are celebrating by hosting Farm and Food Book Week. So each day we have two guest readers. Um, we have Delvin Tomlinson from the Vikings. We have some University of Minnesota um, athletes. We have some Minnesota authors. We have all sorts of great readers who are going to be reading agriculture books via Zoom and also engaging in question and answer sessions with students um, who join in. So we'd love to have you participate in that as well. But for today, we're going to be done. We thank you once again for joining us, and we hope you have a fantastic weekend. Good afternoon.